for this morning. We thank you that the light of Jesus is shining upon us and your word of oh God directs us. And we just want to thank you for this privilege of sitting together in fellowship and hear you speak to us. There are many places around the world where because of persecution and difficulties of various kinds, Christians cannot meet. They wish that they had the opportunities we have. And so we want to thank you for this opportunity to be able to worship you in freedom. And we pray that we can do so in spirit and in truth. This morning as we speak your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will take that which is of you and minister it to us. You are the one whose spirit has brought us together. May he also, God, open our hearts and minds that your word will fall on childlike hearts and grow and bear fruit to the glory of your name. Your word does minister to your people. It brings strength in times of weakness. It brings courage in times of fear. Your word brings healing in times of sickness. And your word comforts in times of sorrow. So, Spirit of the living God, minister to us, minister to us, and this morning glorify your name and bless your people. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, sometime in September, there is going to be an event that takes place in this country, it takes place in Accra, takes place in Takrade, I think, and also in Kumasi, and this year I'm told it's going to take place in Ho also. And this is the Challenge Pastors Conference, the conference that brings together pastors and Christian leaders and brings together resource persons to teach on various topics. Last year, um, the organizers um, came to see me to speak on the program. I've done so before in the past. But somehow um, my schedule did not permit me to do that. So I told them to go and come this year. I never thought that the year would come so quickly. So when they showed up, I was surprised that a year had passed since they first spoke to me. So I had no choice but to accept to speak on the Challenge Passes Conference this year. But then they came with their own topic. And yet they were not sure whether they should stick to that topic or ask my help to change it. So I asked them what the topic was and they said holiness. And I asked them why they had reservations about us speaking on holiness. And they said at their meeting, when the subject came up, they were afraid that if they advertised a conference on holiness, Ghanaian Christians may not attend. I was surprised, but I was also very sad. Very sad because I don't know why a conference that is supposed to be for Christian leaders will not be patronized because it's about holiness. This morning I'd like to continue the series I started on the Beatitudes and I'm going to talk about holiness. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Shall we repeat that together? Blessed, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen. Amen. We have <clears throat> done some exposition on the poor in spirit. That was the first one. And then those who born, and then the meek, and then those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, and then the merciful, 
And today, I'm doing the sixth one. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There are two important expressions in this text. And we are going to examine them, focusing on what Jesus meant when he said, Blessed are the pure in heart. The first expression, the first phrase, is pure in heart. And of course, the second one is, shall see God. The pure in heart shall see God. We all know what the word pure means. If I ask you now what is the meaning of the word pure, I'm sure you'll be able to tell. It usually refers to something that is authentic. Something that is not adulterated. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was in the house of a friend of mine, and um, just on the porch, I was on gallons, some dark substance in them. Now, after our conversation, when he and his wife were seeing me off, the wife said, Professor, I have honey for sale. I just looked at it. And then she added, this is pure honey. Of course, if you are selling something to me, I expect that it to be pure. But the fact that she added the word pure means that sometimes you can buy honey that is mixed with other things. And I'm a boy. It happens all the time. Even palm oil. Ghanaians have crafty ways of putting things in it to make it look attractive. And as we say, it is not everything that glitters that is gold. So when something is pure, it means that the thing is not adulterated. And so she was trying to tell me that the honey that she is selling to me is not adulterated, it's pure. Purity can be superficial. In other words, it can be faked. Purity can be superficial. Now, that happens when there is too much emphasis on outward forms, outward appearance, to the neglect of inward reality. You know what um, Samuel the prophet was told? When he was nearly carried away by the physical appearance of some of the children of the home. You know, Jesse's house, and there were these very strong, charismatic looking young men who looked like kings. And someone, even someone the prophet, was nearly carried away. But God told him, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Amen. Amen. Those who love flattery, for example, are prone to be deceived. If you like to be flattered, if you like people to tell you what you want to hear, people love to tell you things that make you happy, when in fact they do not mean it, especially those of you in leadership. You are the headmaster or headmistress, or you are an MP, or you are in some position of authority. People like to patronize you. And you've got to be able to have the gift of discernment to know who is genuine and who is fake. Especially when you are facing elections. Can be elections in your workplace or in school or whatever, or in politics. People like to play double games. So they will go and tell your opponent to vote for you. Even Trinity, you know, I teach pastors, even there it happens. <laughs> At Trinity, we have uh, what we call pastoral groups in the university, you call them tutorial groups. So every professor has about 20 students that he's supposed to mentor. We we'll meet on Friday mornings. At the first meeting, we are supposed to elect among the students about five people the chairman, the secretary, I think, the finance secretary then treasure or something like that. So that's the first thing we do when we meet. So that during the semester, or during the academic year, 
these people will attend to the affairs of their group. Well, in one year, in my group, a gentleman, when we call for nominations, nominated his friend as chair. And then another person endorsed the nomination. So after that, I asked all those who have been nominated to step out. And then they stepped out. I was surprised that the person who nominated this gentleman didn't vote for him. <laughs> because this was a secret ballot. It's a small group of 20 people, so show by hands. He didn't raise his hand, but he nominated him. I'm sure. And the guy lost anyway. If he had won, I'm sure he would have gone to the dormitory, the hostel, to tell him, Oh, I voted for you. And even tell him about those who didn't vote for him. But I was watching. And after everything, I put it to one of my sermons in the same night. You people, <laughs> from these, these days, I fear you. So people like to tell you what you want to hear. Jesus did not say, Blessed are the pure, or blessed are the holy. He said, Blessed are the pure in heart. In other words, there is a kind of purity, a kind of holiness that we manifest or display simply to impress others. We like public acclaim, we like public endorsement, we like to be praised and flattered. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks deeper. God looks deeper. He looks at the heart. Jesus was clear that the sort of blessedness that he was presenting was for the pure in heart. And if you listen to the passage, the pure in heart are those who do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Or take the way of sins, or sit in the seat of scoffers. They are those who delight in the word of the Lord, in the ways of God. It may cost them, it may make them unpopular, it may not win them public acclaim. But as we sing in a particular hymn, if the master praises, what are men? When we apply this meaning, the pure, when we apply this meaning to the heart, then we get the impression that to see God, a person is expected to have a genuine heart. That's why Jesus compared entry into the kingdom with the behavior of children. He said, if you don't receive the kingdom like a child, you would never enter it. Children don't know how to think. A senior colleague of mine had a very embarrassing situation. Had visitors, fellow ministers visiting him for an event. And as soon as they sat down, he said, let us pray. And he was sitting with his family. And the youngest boy in the family said, Daddy, let's go and eat. Since when have we been praying over meals? That's a true story I'm telling you. <laughs> he wanted to impress those around. But it was a matter of prayer. We pray before we eat. But the boy said, Daddy, this is the first time. Let's eat. A friend or colleague can congratulate you on certain achievements. But such expressions of warmth can be genuine or not, as long as they remain you. In the book of Isaiah, for example, God talks about people who under me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. Isaiah 29 and verse 13. These people under me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. In other words, their worship is not genuine. When you read from Isaiah chapter 1, he says, they raise their hands and they shout and they cry and they prostrate. But it's all fake. It's not genuine. It's not from the heart. 
can find a husband calling the husband the, the wife honey, calling him honey, darling. Obwaso. Jesus also talked about forgiving your brother or your sister from your heart. In Matthew 18, 35, he did not just talk about forgiveness. He said, you have to forgive from your heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. Because God is not carried away by outward appearances and performances. Unfortunately, that's what we have become. We are blocked because the pastor is jumping and sweating and he has removed his jacket. Meanwhile, at home, he is a very poor husband. In the meantime, he is spending church offerings and tithes on himself. But we are carried away by grammar and language and performances. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. We see those relationships like marriages and workplace attitudes. That's what happened to Ananias and Sapphira at the beginning of the church, following Pentecost. Everyone was selling their property and bringing the proceeds so that the poor would no longer go hungry and the rich would not live, uh, live in extravagance. It wasn't by force. These two people, come, conspired to deceive the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 5, verse 3, Peter asks Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So Satan is the one who is fake. And therefore, if you take that attitude, then you have, you have taken the side of the devil. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep for yourself part of the proceeds of the land while it remained unsold. Did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? Then Peter said to him, you have not lied to man but to God. You can get away with it by lying to men, not with God. So Ananias, with the complicity of his wife, had been deceptive. He had not demonstrated purity of heart. He wanted to be praised by men. Purity of heart, my friends, has everything to do with holiness. God said, Be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus 20 and verse 7. Be holy, for I am holy. That's God speaking. I have heard people talk so much about seed sowing, sowing seed in church, and I encourage giving. Giving is good, it brings blessings. I have heard a lot of sermons, and I have preached many myself on tithes and offerings. I have heard a lot about fasting and prayer, and so on and so forth. What we do not hear is that the effectiveness of these religious practices depends on something fundamental, holiness unto the Lord. Tithing is important. Holiness is mandatory. And don't put the two on the same level. Tithing is important. The Bible encourages it. Holiness is mandatory. I have received several suggestions on seven topics, but I have not received a single one on the most important step after coming to Christ. The pursuit of holiness. God talks about it. Be holy, for I am holy. The heavenly host proclaims, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Revelation. The heavenly host proclaimed. And Jesus talks about it. In John 17, 19, he prayed. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. 
so that they also may be truly sanctified. Amen. Amen. So that's pure in heart. That's holiness. The other one is shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. God is spirit. So Jesus could not have meant that the pure in heart will be granted a physical view of God. He is spirit. He has no hands and legs and eyes and ears. I think I explained that to you once, that in Old Testament teaching, there is something that we call anthropomorphism, that is to speak of God as if he has legs and hands and so on. We do that so that human beings can understand that God can hear and God can visit you and so on. But God doesn't have physical legs, he's spirit. In this context, to see God simply means to experience his glory. We have a good example of what it means to see God there in Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3, that was read to us. Blessed is the man, the woman, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of smallness. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. This is how to see God. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. If you believe that, say amen. amen. In the real life, we know that everyone experiences ups and downs. And this includes those who believe in God and faithfully walk in his ways. The fact that I'm a Christian does not mean that I will not have difficulties. If whatever you do prospers, it means that you will discern the Lord's hand in your endeavors. Those who do that live lives of gratitude and contentment. Because they know that as long as they delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on his word day and night, God's will will be done in their lives. Sometimes in our PRC they are losing the battle of life. But God is on the side of those who walk with him. Amen. Amen. Now the story of the fall humanity that we read about in Genesis, for example, gives us the impression that we fundamentally, we are alienated from God. We are fallen human beings. The propensity to sin comes to us naturally. That's why God says in Leviticus, be holy. Be means that you have got to make an effort to work towards it. You know, David, Psalm 51 and verse 5, it says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. It is part of you. We inherited Adam's nature. So the deadly choice David made, the acknowledges here, resulted from his condition of fallenness. That's the human law. Where the first Adam led us. And that's why Jesus comes in as the second Adam. A few months into us, a gentleman that we had all thought was very straight in his thinking, very upright, very honest, very humble, started showing us a different side to his life and being. A friend who belongs to this organization was once complaining in surprise about a turn of events. I listened to him very carefully and I told him that I think that our colleague has always been like that. It's just that putting him into office has given us the opportunity to see how he will handle power, money, and authority. In the past, when he was humble, he didn't have access to the money and the office. He didn't have the opportunity to give instructions. Now he has it. So his true fallen nature is now on display. He has always been like that. Man looks at the outward appearance. That's why we voted for him. 
But God looks at the heart. He will put you there and then expose you. The sins we commit usually come out of the fact that we have inherited a falling Adam nature. In the New Testament, Romans 3.23, Paul says, For all have sinned, falling short of the glory of God. Again, in 1 John 1, 8 to 9, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and purify from all unrighteousness. This is not a New Testament idea. David knew it. So in Psalm 751, after his terrible choice of adultery, he prays from verse 10, Psalm 51 from verse 10, Cleanse me with his son, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Create in me a pure heart of God, and renew a right spirit within me. David is doing something that we should all be doing. Purity of heart has a source in God himself. There are things that you can do out of your own volition. Even unbelievers can pray and fast. An unbeliever can come here and pay and offer a tithe and give offering. That's possible. Holiness, you can fake it. You can fake it for a while. So it has its source. That kind of purity has its source in God himself. That's why David prayed, create in me a pure heart, O oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. And listen to this. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. The Holy Spirit is the source of genuine holiness. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. That purity comes from God Himself. I invite verse 11 of Psalm 51. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. We first learn from David's prayer of forgiveness that it is only God who is a source of cleansing and purity. In Psalm 51, from verse 1, he had prayed, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. The cleansing agent of God is the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of God who by indwelling us comes to make us pure. And that is why he is referred to as the Holy Spirit. In other words, the, the Spirit that is holy. The Spirit makes us holy for God. A people prepared for Him. He makes our heart pure. So we can descend the things and workings of God in our lives and endeavors. When God is at work in your life, that's what it means to see God. That's what led David to say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Because I know that God will abandon me even at times when I'm walking through the valley. I am living His work. I'm walking in purity. And I know he will not abandon me because his word is true and sure. God makes us sensitive to his presence and draws attention to those things that alienate us from him. So if you want to see God, you have to allow his spirit to purify you from your fallen nature and you shall discern his ways in your life. David teaches us that those who fake repentance and think that they can attract God's grace through outward sacrifices are mistaken. So Psalm 51, verse 17, he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. What God is looking for from you is not just your physical substance, it's not just empty fasting and pray. Seven days, 21 days, 40 something days. That's good. It helps you to stay spiritually alert. But it must come from something a little more primary and fundamental. 
the sacrifices of God, what he's actually looking for, a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, God will not despise. In other words, David was suggesting that the heart is acceptable to that is acceptable to God is the one that is genuine. There are people who say sorry just to fulfill the requirement to apologize. But who inwardly do not regret the wrongs they have committed? Purity of heart comes from a genuine sense of one's fallen nature before the Lord. And the fact that it's only Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that cleanses us, that we might see God. You know, Jesus had a lot of problems with the Pharisees precisely because of this. They like to pretend. Going through the ritual motions of religion was their number one priority. Don't work on the Sabbath. Wash your hands properly before you eat and so on. In Matthew 23, verse 27, Jesus was not kind to the Pharisees. He said to them, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs, which looks beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. Paul tries to draw our attention away from such living, hypocritical, religious, or Christian lifestyles. So he says to the Romans, chapter 12, from verse 1, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Writing to Timothy, 1 Timothy 5.22, the last sentence, that Paul writes, keep yourself pure. The last sentence, first Timothy 5 22, keep yourself pure. That meant purity does not come by itself. Paul was telling Timothy, work at it. God said, be holy. That's why most vision statements start with the expression to be. You work towards something. Yourself be Paul in Galatians 5 16. He says, So I say, live by the Spirit, do it. You have to be active, you have to do it purposely, intentionally. Live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. If I have money and you ask me to give a gift to a poor person, that's not difficult. That is not difficult. Anybody at all can do it. So don't judge Christianity by the quantum of money that you gave. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In our age, Christian folk seems to be shifting more and more towards the material things of life. Successful Christian living is now dangerously evaluated in promotion, physical appearance, size of buildings, international travel, and said things by which worldly celebrities are judged. The world celebrities are judged by material acquisitions. And we have brought that to the church. I like the fact that David was aware that purity comes only from God. So he says, create in me a pure heart to God and renew a right spirit within me. In John chapter 13, verses 1 to 17, Jesus was at meals with his disciples. You know the story? When he washed their feet. Peter resisted the idea of his master washing his feet. And then Jesus made a profound statement in order to subdue Peter, Peter's pride. He says, 
unless I wash you, mm. you have no part of me. Mm. Unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Unfortunately, in verse 10, after washing them, Jesus also declared that they were all clean except one, Judas. He was sitting there, but his heart was somewhere else. Judas remained unclean because he allowed impure thought and motives to dominate his thinking. He resisted the promptings to change to the point where he had to set up a meeting, getting up on the table to sell Jesus for just 30 pieces of silver. My dear friends, what this tells you is that it's possible for your Christianity to, be sim to simply be a facade. You may be sitting right in church among God's people, but your thoughts and inner motives may be evil. According to our feet, we do not just have to be pure, we have to be pure in heart. It is easier to fast and pray, and I encourage it. And if you pay tithes and offerings, yes, we have to do it. But holiness or purity of heart is another level. It comes only through an act of the Holy Spirit. Be holy means it will not come to you naturally. You have to work at it. That means our purity must be divine and genuine. My dear friends, may it not be said of any of us that we resisted the cleansing power of the Spirit in Jesus Christ our Lord. We may never know what our end will be. So let us pray with them. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Do you know what David does after that? You go home, read Psalm 51 and read it very carefully. What he does after this prayer is that he begins to evangelize. In verse 13, he says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. I have heard you loud and clear, my friends. We must evangelize. I encourage that with all my heart. I only hope that when the new believers come to our church, they will find people living sanctified lives to the glory of God. What is the point? bringing people in. When among us we want to encounter a holy God, they said that a pure heart, they shall see God.